The most distinctive aspect of the Buddhist Dharma is this rejection of the permanent self. But there's another aspect of self that I think needs to be gotten out. That is, what are the building blocks of what we see around us that looks like a self? These are what's known as the five aggregates, and that's what I'll be discussing today. I'm Doug Smith of the Online Dharma Institute. That's onlinedharma.org, where you can go to find courses about the early Buddhist Dharma. If you're new to this channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to this channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. So as I say, one of the most distinctive features of Dharma, the Buddhist Dharma, particularly the Dharma of early Buddhism, is this notion of non-self, that there isn't a permanent, unchanging, essential nature to us. And this notion of non-self brings in its wake all kinds of questions about personal responsibility, about persistence over time. I've done a number of videos on those topics. I'll put links down below in the show notes. Uh, but today I want to get to the other side of that coin, if you like, because in many ways the Buddha's uh, Dharma, his discussion of the self, is kind of a middle way, as he himself says, between complete non-existence and permanent existence. Now there are many ways of understanding this middle way. Perhaps the most famous is, in, is through the idea of dependent origination, that the self is a kind of a dependently originated thing that comes out of causes and conditions and is always changing. And I've also done a video on that, or at least similar topics, and I'll put a link to that down below. But here I want to get at another way of looking at it, which is what are the building blocks that go into the self? What is, if, although we don't see a permanent self, we see something, we don't see nothing, so what is it that we're seeing? Here we're seeing what are known as the five aggregates, or the five aggregates of clinging. They're, they're the things that we, the, the aspects of our experience or the world that we cling to as a self. Now the first of these aggregates that I'll discuss is the aggregate of what's called form. Form, when understood in the context of the we're understanding it, the context of the self, it resolves itself into the body, in particular, let's say, the human body. So the first of these, uh, of these aggregates is the human body. And in one early text, it talks about how the human body is made up of the four elements. And these four elements come to us through food. So we ingest these elements in our food. They become part of our body. And these elements are understood in the typical early way of earth, air, fire, and water. Uh, these are the uh, kinds of understandings of the material world that that uh, persisted way in in ancient in the ancient world. There, uh, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, as well had this idea of these four elements that were in all things. Uh, nowadays, uh, that kind of understanding of materiality is considered uh, obsolete. We now think of things in terms of chemicals, chemical elements. But the same thing could be true. We could also say just as easily that form is constituted of the chemical elements. And so if we want to think of it that way, we certainly could. Now, there are various, I should say, having said that, that there are a number of different controversies or differences of opinion over how we should interpret uh, this particular aggregate of form, as well as the other aggregates, I should say. Um, I'll get to that uh, later on in this video, in case some of you have questions about that. I'll come to that at the end. But in any event, what we have in this system of five aggregates is one aggregate that is, we might say, physical, that involves the physical body, and four that are mental, that involve the mind. And it's this, uh, these, uh, this causal, uh, causal impact between these five aggregates that creates the sense of self. Now, I should also say that uh, this uh, first aggregate of, of, of form is something that we can cling to. We can cling to any of these aggregates. And then do we, we ordinarily do one after the other. How do we cling to form? Well, we cling to it by thinking of this body as who I am. That uh, not only that, but we cling to the way it looks. We identify ourselves with our face, with our beauty, let's say. 
that we identify ourselves with our youth. And so when we change the way we look, when we get gray hair or when we get wrinkles, uh, we become affected. We, we get sad. We, get, we feel that it's a form of dukkha, of, of, of suffering, because we've clung to the body as who we really are. And we find that that body changes, as all things do. So we might say that these clinging aggregates are the building blocks of change. They're the things, the, 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 the building blocks that change with us. Now, the second one of these aggregates is the aggregate of feeling, and this is part of the mind. Now, feeling, otherwise known as feeling tone, uh, does not mean uh, emotion. It's not about emotions. Instead, it's about pleasant and unpleasant, or pleasant and painful. This ability that we have to see the world in terms of things that we find pleasurable and things we find painful and other things that we find neutral, that we don't really care about, that we don't, that don't uh, either please us or displease us. It's kind of this judgmental aspect of our own minds. This is another aspect of who we are and another thing that we can also cling to. Um, that is to say, uh, many of us will cling to this, uh, this ability of ourselves to judge, to think of ourselves as critics, to take personally our own judgments as, as the right ones, as something that is uh, absolutely essential to who we really are. So, you know, I am my judgments, and if somebody disagrees with me, that means that uh, there's something hateful in them, uh, because we cling to our own uh, desires, our own feeling of what is pleasurable and unpleasurable, and somebody, you know, if I like chocolate ice cream and somebody doesn't, well, we feel personally offended by that. And we, we've all been there. Uh, that's another way that we can cling to these one of these aggregates, the aggregate of feeling. I should say that in early Buddhism, it's mentioned that there are six different types of feeling, a one for each sense organ, that is the five organs of the ordinary senses plus the mind. And each of these senses can bring to us pleasant or unpleasant things. We can have pleasant sights and uh, painful sights, or pleasant sounds and painful sounds, or pleasant thoughts and unpleasant thoughts, or painful thoughts. Uh, now, this kind of uh, division of each of these into types is going to uh, persist for all of them. All of them have divisions into types. The third uh, one of these aggregates is the aggregate of perception. And oftentimes when we think of perception, uh, we think of it as sort of raw seeing, just this kind of um, just uninterpreted kind of visual or auditory seeing of the world experiencing of the world. That's not what's meant here. In Buddhism, perception is a very active kind of intellectual operation. It's our body's innate ability, if you like, our mind's innate ability to recognize things, to categorize them. So that when we open our eyes, we don't just see a kind of a, an unformed experience of the world. Instead, we see trees and chairs and tables and books we see people, uh, we see people even as uh, good or bad. We, we, we may see a face and think of it as, as being the face of somebody who is a pleasant person or seeing a face of somebody who is unpleasant. Um, the, these kinds of immediate judgments are the kinds of things that the mind simply brings up to us. It's not sort of thing we have under our control. It's something that just simply the world is, is interpreted to us. And the same thing with hearing or smelling. We'll, we'll have a smell and all of a sudden we'll recognize something that we haven't smelled in a long time. That is perception in Buddhism. And we can also cling to this ability to perceive and think of it as essential to who we are, our sort of judgmental capacities, if you like. Our abilities to come to quick judgments about what's right and what's wrong or uh, whether something is a certain thing or is not a certain thing. Uh, many of us sort of make our lives that way, of, of, of judging, uh, not in a sense of good and bad necessarily, although it could be that, but just in a sense of, of telling what is what. You know, I, I, you know sort of like the, 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 the scientist type, let's say, or uh, the rationalist type who sort of judges this from that. That is a way we can cling to our perceptual abilities. And again, there are six types of perception corresponding to the six senses. Uh, that is to say, the five senses, ordinary senses, plus the, the mind. 
and each of them involves, for in Buddhism, a kind of perception. Uh, the eye perceives uh, visual things, the ear perceives auditory things, and the mind perceives ideas, as least that's how it's expressed in Buddhism. Now, the fourth of these aggregates is the aggregate which is sometimes translated as volitional formations, which is kind of a mouthful. The, the Pali word is sankhara, and it's difficult quite to translate that term. It's from, I think, a non-Buddhist perspective is something of a sort of a grab bag category, but it's not uh, completely unnatural. It's the category that surrounds what we might call emotional kinds of things. That is, our, the part of our mind, the part, the part of us, the, 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 sun, the, the uh, aggregate, the, the, the part of ourself, insofar as we have a self, which is always changing, that's what we've been talking about, this part of our mind uh, that is volitional, that, that gets us to do something. So in all the other things, we've simply been talking about relatively passive kinds of interpretations, passive things. Whereas the sankhara, that is what gives us an emotional attachment or an emotional move either toward something or away from something that, that makes us love it or hate it, that makes us uh, become involved with it or not. And in this sense, the, the sankhara sort of construct the world, as it were, because we think of the world in terms of what we can do to change it. And when we're in that frame of mind of wanting to change things, wanting to make th something come into being which is not here yet, or wanting to extinguish something from being because we don't like it, um, then we're in the realm of sankharas. And again, many of us will cling to this volitional ability of ours to think of ourselves as doers, to think of who we are as constituted by what we've done in our lives, uh, as opposed to anything else. And uh, again, that's a sort of way that we can uh, become very seriously saddened if we lose the ability to act properly, either because something's happened to us, or because perhaps we've gotten older and less able to carry out the functions that we ordinarily did in our jobs, either mentally or physically. Um, that can, this can also be a source of, of great sadness for us, of great dukkha, if we cling to this aspect of, of, the, of, of our clinging aggregates, this, this aspect of our constructed self. And as with these other cases, there it's said that there are six different types of volitional formation, one each corresponding to a particular sense. So there are volitions involving uh, the sense of sight, involving the sense of hearing, and so on, and presumably those are uh, volitions that are brought about by seeing things of a certain kind or hearing things of a certain kind. So we'll, let's say, see something that's attractive and we'll, uh, the volition will come up on us to, uh, to acquire that thing. Then that, that volition will be thought of as a kind of an eye-oriented volition. It's, it's been, um, it's been uh, triggered by, by sight as opposed to by hearing, let's say. Now the fifth and final of these uh, aggregates of form, or I should say, of, of clinging, is the, the aggregate of consciousness. Now, consciousness is often thought of as kind of a unified thing, as a sort of a, uh, a one thing that sort of stands behind everything else. Uh, but that's not the way it's seen in early Buddhism. The Buddha himself expressly said on several occasions that consciousness comes, just as these other ones do, in kinds, in types. And there are indeed six types of consciousness, one each corresponding to the corresponding uh, sense type. So there is eye consciousness corresponding to vision. There's ear consciousness corresponding to hearing. Again, uh, nose consciousness corresponding to olfaction, taste consciousness, feeling, or that is to say, uh, touch consciousness corresponding to the physical touch and mental consciousness corresponding to consciousness of ideas. And these consciousnesses are always flitting in and out of, of existence as we're conscious of seeing something, then conscious of hearing something, then conscious of thinking something. The, so they're always changing. And once again, uh, many of us, some of us, at least historically, uh, people who come up with ideas of the self will tend to cling to consciousness as well as who we really are. Um, and for the Buddha, that's just as problematic as anything else. So these five aggregates of clinging, that is uh, form, feeling, perception, 
uh, volitional formations in consciousness, these are always changing. They're always changing depending upon uh, outside influences and internal influences. They're coming and going. Uh, they're passing away and being reborn in different ways all the time. And yet we cling to them one and the other depending on how we're feeling that particular day. Uh, now, I mentioned at the beginning that, or near the beginning, that there are different ways of interpreting these five, that there's sort of a controversy here. Um, controversy may be too strong a word, but in any event, different ideas. On the one hand, we can see these five as kind of part of the furniture of the world, part of the objective way that the world is, is that there are bundles of these five aggregates out there. Another way we can interpret them is to see them as ways to categorize our own internal experience, sort of ways to uh, uh, categorize the phenomena that surrounds us. So if we think of within ourselves, we have some phenomena that are volitional phenomena, other phenomena that we experience that have to do with our body, other that have to do with um, perception and so on. So the question is, are these objective, sort of part of the furniture of the world, or are these simply the way we categorize our internal states for purposes of practice? And for my own sake, the answer would be yes, that is to say, both. That is also to say that the Buddha really doesn't distinguish these two ways of seeing things. This distinction between the furniture of the world versus internal phenomena is a relatively recent or at least later kind of interpretation, a sort of a sophisticated inter interpretation of uh, philosophy, shall we say. Uh, the Buddha interprets them both ways. Uh, that is, in one early text, he t talks about the five aggregates we've been discussing as part of what exists. He says that when people ask what exists, I agree with the wise, that what exists are form, feeling, perception, volitional formations and consciousness. And so that's part of what exists. But on the other hand, the Buddha clearly, uh, when he uses these phenomena, or these, these concepts, he uses them didactically to help us practice, to help us become enlightened. Um, that they're useful to our, our path of practice. Uh, that seeing the world in this way makes the world more amenable to the, the walking the Buddhist path. So it's both, it's not one or the other. Now, if you're interested in this topic of, of self and non-self, I have an earlier video talking about five ways we construct a self using these kinds of concepts. And I'll put a link to that video up here on the screen. If you're getting something out of these uh, crazy videos of mine, these Dharma videos, Take a look at my Patreon page, it's linked down below. Help out the channel and get something in return. You'll see if you go there to the page. Thanks so much and we'll catch you on the next one. And meanwhile, all of you be well.